What's up ladies and gents, Noli here. Welcome back to another Payday video. Welcome back to my office in the kitchen. I am of course on camera today because we've just hit an incredible milestone, 100,000 subscribers. I wanna thank each and every one of you who just happens to have clicked on one of my videos once, who've been subscribed for all nine years since I've been creating Payday content. And of course I wanna thank Overkill for making the fantastic game that has, uh, that has given me this opportunity in Payday 2 and of course Payday the Heist as well. Um, I thought today, since I'm on camera, I may as well finally get a tier list out the way. This is going to be my heist tier list, so we're going to run through that in just a moment. Thank you very much to Beef Jerky for sending this over. Um, but don't worry, this is not a, uh, a massive celebration video for hitting 100k. I have something a little bigger planned. Some of you may be aware of exactly what that is. It's currently being edited, and um, I'm really excited to share it with you. It's a uh, it's a new sort of project I have going on when it comes to Payday and um, hopefully it'll expand interest in that particular field because I had an absolute blast recording it live on stream. With all that said, let's get directly into the tier list. I'm going to go through these in alphabetical order. Um, I'm going to do my very best just quickly to explain what each of my tiers mean. Of course, this is not a game where it's all about balance here. You know, not everything has to be around the B tier. Heists aren't overpowered if they're very good. Generally, I like Payday 2, so expect things to be higher up on the tier list and not in that C, D tier. But essentially, if something's in S tier, it's either virtually a flawless heist or any of the flaws it does have are completely outweighed by what makes it such a good heist. Something in A tier is a heist that's always a ton of fun to play, pretty much no matter what the circumstance. Well balanced, well designed. B is your quintessential mid-tier, you know, this is where I will place heists that I think absolutely do their job. I'm never overly concerned about doing them or not, though. C is when we start looking into the slightly lower tier heists. They're still absolutely fine, but maybe you have to feel a certain way to want to play them. D tier is when we start looking at the heists that I'm truly not a big fan of. I think there's something that's either a, a glaring error in how it was designed or... Um, just mechanically the heist doesn't work or maybe it just didn't add anything to the story or the narrative of Payday 2. Of course I will be factoring in narrative factors within these heists. It is important how a story is told through a heist. And finally F tier, I don't expect there'll be much going in here but of course these are heists that I'd really rather never touch and will only do so for things like crazy challenge runs. So my recent experience doing certain things has led to me uh, turning on some heists that maybe in the past I've been a big fan of, but of course, doing the challenge runs, doing the story of Payday, I do have some extra insights into what makes a heist good, what can sometimes make a heist frustrating. Um, of course, I want to hear from each and every one of you. If you want to do this tier list yourselves, all the way through, like I said to Matt and Master, um, the link will be in the description. Please do share them with me. I, uh, I think it's a really interesting point of conversation. Um, without further ado, though, let's get into it. Okay, so tidy a few things from the background and also move the camera over to the opposite side so you can see the entire tier list. Let's get straight into it with Alaskan Deal. Alaskan Deal for me is absolutely an A tier heist. I love the narrative twist here with Locke. Of course, he's been working with us and now it seems like he's on the other side. And the fact that this twist once again later in the heist makes it probably all the more special in my opinion, or later in the series, I should say. So it's pretty important for the Payday 2 narrative. Um, I'm not normally a huge fan of, of snowy aesthetics, but I do think Alaskan Deal and, and Boiling Point later on are really nice looking heists as well, which is important when it comes to, to ranking in this tier list. From a gameplay standpoint, I think it's somewhere in the middle when it comes to difficulty, which is nice. It's quite short, concise, tight to gameplay. Um, I like the way you have to make pretty long runs through open areas. It forces you to, to be intelligent with your pathing, to hold out waves sometimes just to make those moves or to just use things like flashbangs they're incredibly useful on this heist and then when you're actually around objectives generally the cover is fairly good so the snipers aren't as much of an issue as they are on later heists. snipers are probably the enemy type i hate the most and i will complain about them later on an awful lot so alaskan deal for me is is quintessentially the perfect one day heist it's the right duration it's the right difficulty level and um combat's really good. The only reason it doesn't make it into S tier for me is it's just not that grand. There's not there's nothing super impressive about Alaskan Deal, but it does do all the basics right, which is all we can really ask for, I suppose. 
Aftershock is an interesting one. This heist came out at the wrong time. It came out when Payday was undergoing probably its, its worst ever controversy. And um, in a way, this heist promoted the controversy. So it definitely didn't get a fair shake at it at first. But as, as time has gone on, the pros of this heist have become more obvious to me. It, it's a pretty cool looking and well set heist. I love the idea of heisting after an earthquake. Um, but the issues are, are more and more clear. So we already know driving is not paid a strong suit. The van feels clunky and difficult to move. On higher difficulties, you absolutely don't want to use the van at all. Instead, you have to move bags one by one, so it turns into a bag moving simulator, which is something else I'll be critical of quite a lot in this list. So for me, Aftershock just doesn't hit the highs it could with that fantastic setting and premise. The objectives are too too simplistic and it's just a case of moving things. Um, there's also a lot, an awful lot of waiting around in this heist. If, if you are planning to take the bags by the van after you've found them, you just have to wait for about three minutes for the C4 to drop. And then at the end, when you're defending the van, you just have to wait in a completely bland open room while the world moves around you you know there's no there's nothing active that you can be doing and i don't think that's particularly great design i think it, it shows that they were sort of devoid of ideas um of what to do and i think this is the sort of heist that would really benefit from being on a better engine um and i think payday 3 could do an awful lot with it there could be a lot more choice we could have the earthquake going on actually as we heist um some more adaptable landscape that sort of thing it's a great premise heist but it just doesn't land it also the the whole thing about vlad and seattle it went nowhere so from a narrative standpoint it did nothing the alesso heist is a funny one it's a uh, a crossover heist with alesso who of course released the song payday which is a great track and features heavily within this heist the music is of course one of the focuses of this heist um and I think it, it does everything fairly well. Um, it's one of the harder stealth heists in the game, but I think that's good to have. Whilst stealth is not my favourite playstyle, I generally prefer to play loud. Um, I do think it's important that we have extremely difficult stealth heists that, that are worth tackling and, and really challenge us. Um, the DJ objective is pretty cool and unique, especially the first few times you do it. I do think on stealth it's a little bit boring. There's not a lot going on, just pressing buttons. Whereas at least in loud, you know, you have to fend off the cops at the same time. As a loud heist, I think the objective is a little bit sporadic and strange and don't make an awful lot of sense. I absolutely hate having to use the uh, the forklift trucks down in the basement. That is not fun. It's really fiddly. But um, it's not a reason to really jump on this heist back, to be honest. It has enough innovation in it and, and it's a, a pleasant enough looking heist. And I think it's a, a good enough playground for loud that I, I, I still think it falls into the B tier, um, despite it essentially being a bit of a shameless promotion. Bank Heist is up next. It shouldn't be. Art Gallery should be up next. Let's talk about Art Gallery really quickly. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this more. I'm just going to put it straight into the C tier. I don't think it's a bad heist. I think it's much better tailored for stealth. As a loud heist, it is pretty rough. It's not really well designed for that. It's maybe a little too easy. Um, but there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to Art Gallery because really it's day one of Framing Frame, which is in and of itself a much more interesting heist. Um, I, I definitely think this could be in... in B tier as well. I'm actually put it above Aftershock. It's, it's somewhere around that average, but I've decided to drop it down mainly because I think it offers two approaches, but really it's a stealth heist. It's not well balanced for, for both um, approaches. Bank Heist, though, is it's so iconic. It's impossible not to at least put it in the A tier. Um, I can't stre stretch for S, even though this heist is Payday 2 for me. Harvest and Trusty is just so iconic. I think even people who've never touched Payday 2 may recognize what game it's from. Um, but I think if it was made now, there'd be a lot more um, variability in terms of objectives and approaches. If you think about it, it is just a case of chuck a, uh, a drill down, which is the new Payday 2 mechanic they were sort of introducing, and wait for that drill. And it's fine. It's like a, like a horde shooter area defense. But I mean, especially if you do it in stealth, what's the reward? The reward is just to wait for the drill, but without people shooting at you. So you've got nothing particularly fun to do. So I, I think that's a, that's an issue with it. There should have been more going on in stealth, and I think they realised this in later heists, but you just can't argue with how, how iconic, how well laid out, and how important this heist was for the future of Payday 2. So that's why it still goes relatively high up. Next up, we have Beneath the Mountain, which is a, a cool sprawling heist. It's sort of the first single-day heist that attempted to get a multi-day feeling across. Payday was, at that point, generally straying away from multi-day heists because... I think they were considered a bit long and cumbersome and harder to design. Um, and that's what I say about things like Alaskan Deal. It's a tight, short heist, and, and I think it benefits from that. But Beneath the Mountain is sprawling, and really it takes place across three separate environments. 
um, which are all fun to play around and all well balanced. I really like that. We have the outdoor courtyard, we have the compound itself, and then we of course have the escape on the uh, the roof of the compound. All of that is brilliant. We actually get to meet Locke in person, which is cool. Locke in these early heists is incredible. I think this is when he absolutely peaked, not just in terms of performance, but I think he was given the best lines. Sassy Locke is the best Locke. So with all that in mind, Beneath the Mountain goes in A as well. Um, it does have some smaller issues, if you ask me. Um, I think that some of the combat in is, is not that well balanced around all playstyles, which can be okay. You know, you have a specialist for the start, middle, and end. But sometimes it's frustrating, especially on challenge runs, when you, when you get out to the open. There's just so many snipers. Snipers are just used to elevate difficulty a lot of the time, and I don't think they add an awful lot to the gameplay, um, especially when they're added in numbers. I'll complain about it a lot. I think I've already mentioned. Um, and, and Beneath the Mountain is is bad for this, which is which is why it's A, not S. But Big Bank is S. I don't I don't think I need to to tell you why, really. In, I think it was 2014 E3. This is the heist that Overkill brought to E3. This was their big showing, and no one was complaining. Like They weren't bringing a whole new game. They were just bringing one heist, but that heist was about to change the game. Because with Payday, the heist, everything felt pretty high stakes. Everything felt like it was something out of a movie. But with Payday 2, things felt sort of like local robber. But then suddenly we had the Big Bank, and we had a brand new, maybe not faction at this point, but character in The Dentist, who was played by an incredibly recognisable actor. Um, we got a brand new live action trailer for it, which is one of the best acted trailers I think we ever received. Um, and it was exciting. So not only did Big Bank introduce the, the grandeur of, of future heists, it massively upped the scale. It, um, it added pre-planning, which is also huge, and has some of the best pre-planning in the game. You can approach the drilling differently, you can approach the escape very differently, you can even change how you, you go about stealth, for example, make stealth a little bit easier. So all fantastic additions to how Payday 2 is played, and to play a choice, which up until this point was a little bit limited, in my opinion. Um, and it did it also effortlessly, whilst also being one of the best luck and heists in the game, um, whilst also creating the first bit of intrigue around the dentist as a character. Of course, it was implied that how's this guy been alive for so long if he's been looking to rob the big bank for like 50-something years? He looks about 50 years old tops. So um, this really was the start of it, the start of the, the dentist's uh, campaign with the Payday Gang, which we all know would end at the White House. Big Bank's phenomenal. Probably one of the best heists in the game. Now, I don't enjoy it as much as some others. I think the RNG of certain objectives, especially at the start, are really frustrating as a solo player. But um, it's not enough to take it away from the S tier. It's got too much going for it. It changed how Payday heists were developed and how Payday was played. Big Oil was another one. This was probably the, the highest in terms of uh, scope when Payday 2 came out for me. I think it probably falls in just behind the bank heist, um, but just ahead of Beneath the Mountain. Big Oil was a very difficult heist, especially at launch. Um, the concept really, as far as I was concerned, was they took the secret hunting from Payday the Heist with Overdrill and decided, let's just try putting those mechanics into day two of our heist and see how players manage. And it's a challenge. It's a proper puzzle. And I'm disappointed Overkill didn't make more puzzle heists. But I know some people find Big Oil incredibly frustrating. And it's sort of a one and done, never touch again. It's too complex for me. Why would I want to learn this stuff? So it's one of those each to their own. Overkill would probably rather make heists that are more accessible to everyone. I understand. But I hope there are heists like this in Payday 3. I really, really do. Um, day 1's cool. It's the first sort of Hitman style assassin heist where if you don't go in with ECMs, it's all about how you uh, take out the biker members without them seeing each other, without them firing bullets. I think that's really cool. It, it lends itself, itself to like a quick fire rush play style in stealth, which was kind of unique. Normally it was either smash and grab or it was uh, sneak carefully. This was somewhere in between. Um, and then day two is, of course, where all the complexity comes about. I don't think the initial objectives are particularly great. Um, but I do think that the pick out the, the engine is phenomenal. And it's also a really good looking heist. I think it was one of the more uh, attractive heists at launch. Um, so it, it was the holy grail at launch. And I think in some ways it still is when it comes to, to certain elements of difficulty. Difficulty doesn't just have to be DSOD. Oh, everything hits hard. And, and I think Big Oil got that absolutely spot on. The biker heist, on the other hand, 
I can't put it on that in F. It's not that bad, but I do not like the biker heist. I think it's one of those heists which really comes as a wall in my challenge runs, and that's one of the reasons I dislike it. But I also just think there were some design choices that perplex me. And I think the narrative around it with the biker, with Rust, the Overkill MC, who of course we now know are somewhat linked to Murky Water, and the BCI helmet, I think all that went nowhere and it was a shame. The BCI helmet could have been the way that the, the Kataru were planning to control the military. Imagine if they were mass producing these things. Really the dentist plan was a little too simplistic in the end, in my opinion. Um, and adding these elements would have created some more intrigue i think so waste potential as well even angrier at it for that how dare you biker heist but i think the objectives they're interesting enough but um the, the randomness of it can be extremely frustrating in particular the fact that the major objective to defend the biker or the mechanic can be placed right in front of a swap van turret which if you don't have the right sort of build might just be shooting at you the entire heist unlucky I don't think that's particularly fun. Um, snipers are really nasty on this heist as well. They can spawn on top of the, the bridge and shoot through the concrete. So for some reason they have clipping issues um, and that makes it extra frustrating. And then on the escape, the bike just doesn't drive like a bike. It's far too wide. It can get stuck in the tunnel. It's frustrating. Um, maybe this would be an F if it wasn't for the fact that I think day two is an A tier heist. I think day two of the biker heist on its own, standalone within crime spree, is really good. It's basically a cinematic gauntlet that involves us just running straight along a train as fast as possible, taking out the boss and running back again, but with some new curveballs thrown our way, you know, potentially a uh, a swap chopper with a turret underneath. So that, that was a, a cool new mechanic they added there. So day two is brilliant, and uh, I think it's, it's a shame you have to trudge through day one to get there. Birth of Sky. Now, Locke, I think, is even funnier in this house than he is in Beneath the Mountain, so it does get brownie points for that. And the initial open, opening sort of cinematic entrance through the plane and skydive is fantastic. I like gauntlets in Payday 2. They can be really fun to play through, and this is a satisfying one. Once we actually land, it's not as fun. Um, I don't really like the way it's laid out. I don't think the objectives are particularly uh, innovative or interesting. It's just a case of finding some money pals, defending them, rebuilding one of them, which actually can be quite a frustrating objective if you don't know all the spawns. So for me, this one has to go in C. I think the escape is pretty intense and quite interesting. It does go at the top of C, though. It, it could be argued it should go in B, to be honest. Um, but from my perspective, once again, I don't like the way snipers spawn on this heist on opposite sides. It causes a real issue to, to many, many builds. If you don't have the range to take them out or you don't have the armor to, to survive shots, it can turn it into a bit of a dice roll. And this is one of the heists on challenge runs that I need the lifeline system for. Because in the escape in particular, um, there's just too many bulldozers for certain builds. And again, it's a wall. The swap van turrets that spawn at the end, I think, are cool. They up the ante. Um, but it isn't enough to, to rescue it from C tier, in my opinion. But it's not a dreadful heist, don't, don't get me wrong. The Black Cat is up next. It's the first of the New Wave DLC heists, and it's uh, probably one of the best, I believe. It's a really ornate-looking heist. It looks phenomenal. Um, I think it's quite cool that we actually have a potentially loud heist, if that's the approach you want to take at C. Um, people were always really excited for the Yacht Heist, and this is just an expansion on that in many ways. It has an incredibly cool mechanic in that you can approach the get the, this heist with the intent to go silently, fail stealth, and still go about the same similar stealth objectives. It's sort of an assassination heist in that sense, and I, I think that's cool. But also you can go, well, actually, I know where the C4 is. I'm going to go down and blow up this wall. And if you did the stealth approach first, ended up going loud and found that C4 on your own, I bet that felt amazing. It was like finding a secret. And Payday needs more of that. It needs more secrets like that within their regular heist. Different, unique ways of approaching it. Now, this isn't so much a secret because that's the way the game wants you to take on the heist if you do the loud entrance. But you didn't necessarily know that on your first playthrough. And for a moment, I thought, wow, this is genius. Um, I still think it's a great way that the heist can be played. I think it's great that we have that versatility. But I do wish it was more on organically done, I suppose is how I should say it. Um... Story-wise, this doesn't really advance the campaign an awful lot, but I think from a dialogue standpoint, Vlad is brilliant and really carries this heist. It's great, again, this is something that we saw in the more recent heist. Uh, it's a multi-contractor heist, basically. It's contracted by Vlad, but Locke's there as well, given the instructions. So there's some good back and forth there, which I think helps improve and flesh out the narrative whenever it happens. For me, the Black Cat is it's just above the bank heist. It's just I, I enjoy the complexity. I really enjoy 
the way that you don't choose your escape. Your escape is actually, uh, through pre-planning I mean, your escape is the logical escape based on how you approach the heist. And I think that's really cool. Boiling point is, of course, where Jimmy was added, my favorite character. Um, it's another snowy heist that I really like the look of. I like the, the the flow of this heist, the way it progresses. Starts out in the open, and there's some challenge there, and then you eventually move into the compound where it's all much more close quarters, but SWAT turrets can spawn and cause a real issue. Um, it is very much a waiting, defend the area setup, but there's a lot more moving around on this heist than some more holdout style heist that you might come across. I think its greatest issue is the fact that on the escape, um, the way they made the escape difficult is just by throwing lots of snipers at you. So once again, certain builds are massively punished. This one was really difficult within the no shooting challenge. And to make matters worse, Death Wish is harder on this heist than it is on most heists because the, the unique Russian enemy types carry different weapons. I, I say to make matters worse, I actually think that's fantastic, um, but it is added challenge. This is probably the hardest Death Wish heist in the game, which is weird to say, because it's also one of the easiest Death Sentence heists, because Death Sentence is either bugged or Overkill wanted it to be that way, in that cops don't do any, any additional damage compared to their Death Wish counterparts, which is weird. Um, not a tremendous issue, but it, it, it means boiling point is a little bit flawed. I suppose. I like the narrative. I think it, Hardcore Henry fits really well. I like the Wick universe into the Payday universe. I don't think it sort of steps on any toes. So for me, this one goes straight into A tier, somewhere around Alaskan Deal, probably a little bit better in my eyes. Um, that's the Jimmy factor, raising it up a level. Border Crossing, though, sadly, I have to be incredibly critical here about this heist. It was This heist was a test. It was the first Silk Road heist. It was a test of is our community still alive? Will they buy the content we release? The answer was yes, but a lot of people were buying the content probably to support Overkill, not because Border Crossing is a phenomenal heist. I think if this heist was split into a day one and a day two, it would be infinitely better, but instead it, it tested the concept if we have a, uh, a US side and a Mexico side, we make them both sort of sizable day level heists in their own accord, or, or in their own right, I should say, um, but then we make it so if you fail during what should be day two, you've got to go all the way back to the start. It's just so unnecessary. And day two is, whilst I think day one's absolutely fine, I quite like that once again, it's a biker rush, no pages, just take out the bikers in the most efficient way you possibly can. Hitman style. Um, I think day two is really cumbersome. Um, not only is it got lots and lots of copy and pasted assets which is fine they were trying to save a lot of time and, and resources whilst creating this of course financial troubles were were at, at the, the worst around the time that border crossing was was released or things were only just starting to get better but um it's just a bag moving simulator on a reused heist so there's nothing really exciting or impressive about it and it's frustrating because you have to go all the way back to the start even though by all rights, it should be separate days. So the concept doesn't do it. I do think day one is quite pretty. I do think that it sets up the story in an okay fashion. I mean, border crossing, you have to do some digging, but you, you start to find hints to certain characters like Bullock. But it's uh, it, it doesn't compete with other heists in the uh, Silk Road series, if you ask me. And border crystal is exactly the same. Like, just got to put us on that really dreary compound again. Thanks for nothing, guys. It's not an F-tier heist, though. Like, there is at least gameplay. I think that the US side of the border carries it from that sense, both in stealth and loud. So I, that holds it up out of the dreaded F-tier. It's playable, but it's not the sort of heist I particularly want to play, which falls right in line with the biker heist. Breakfast in Tijuana is uh, another simplistic heist. Um, it's not as tight as Alaskan Deal, but I think the intention was to make it a, a heist like that. This one's frustrating in some ways because this was the first time that where I started noticing the issues in the new way that heists were designed, where you get given an objective, as in Locke would tell you, we need to do this. And the idea is you use your, your brain a little bit like the puzzle on Big Oil and work out, oh, okay, so for that, I need to find this. Where would I find that object? And you, you just search around the map. So um, it's Overkill trying to get us to engage our brains, which is fine. But often the clues are not enough to tell you where to go. The maps aren't designed or laid out to help you find what it is you need. And what ends up happening is you just have to wait two minutes until Locke highlights exactly where it is you need to go. And I, I think that's particularly frustrating because on later runs, you'll just know where to go. That's fine. 
and on your first run it just slows things down and it doesn't really let you think about anything in, in my opinion. So Breakfast in Tijuana runs into that issue but um, I do actually think as a heist it has a fine layout, um, the objectives are okay, in stealth it's a little bit claustrophobic at times but sometimes I think that can be fun to play around um, and I like the escape. The escape's fun and, and, and is where the difficulty sort of ramps up because it is quite an easy heist otherwise. But it's still not a particularly impressive heist in my opinion. Um, it's one that I've enjoyed in the past, maybe because it's a, a fun death sentence heist because it's not so difficult. Um, but to me it has to fall somewhere in the C tier. Somewhere around Birth of Sky probably. I, I, I put it ahead of Art Gallery. Breaking Feds, the uh, the classic, everyone's least favourite stealth heist, probably um, definitely one of the hardest stealth heists. Now, I put Alesso in B and, and gave it points for being difficult because it's quite well crafted and interesting. Breaking Feds is difficult because it's so overpopulated. Overpopulation is not fun to play around. Um, it just means you have to wait an awful long time. From a narrative standpoint, yes, it's an important heist. One thing that makes very little sense is why we can't kill Garrett. There are some reasons, potentially, why we couldn't kill Garrett. But um, I honestly struggle to see them. I think maybe Overkill originally planned to use Garrett more in the future. Uh, and he didn't. And, and they didn't, at least within within this, uh, within this within the end of the Payday 2 story. Um, so Breaking Feds is just strange. It, it's very frustrating when you get caught by Garrett, who you obviously can't kill. Maybe you should be able to intimidate him, and that would make it a little bit more fun um, when you're going in for the, for the code. Once you've learnt what the codes can be, it's just a case of going in once, probably getting the code wrong, and then going in again and getting it right, hopefully, and then you'll complete the heist. No issues. But um, as, as a learning curve, Breaking Feds has a pretty steep one. So for me, it's another C-tier heist. It's, uh, I like the difficulty, and I, I, I like to push myself to play it from time to time, but uh, even when speedrunning it, this is a 10 minute heist just because you've got to be so damn careful, mistakes are so easy to make. Um, so it falls in and around where I have Art Gallery, maybe just marginally ahead of it. Brooklyn 1010, this is a John Wick heist and one that I think is actually really fun from a loud perspective. Um, it's one of those where it's played at close range and medium range, there are enemies on the outside that we have to deal with to help Sharon, Karen, however we say his name. Um, but on the opposite end of things, it's also incredibly intense when you're getting rushed from behind. So you have to balance those two things and that juggling act's quite well set up. In many ways, this is the perfect wick heist because it's an assassination heist. What, what the predominant objectives are throughout are kill these gangsters. So it's unique in that sense, really. Payday doesn't have that many, uh, multi-enemy assassination heists, um, it's really a quintessential, this is how loud should be made, in my opinion. It's an A-tier heist, Brooklyn 1010. It definitely, definitely is. I really like that there's a, a low percentage chance for a different style escape where uh, Twitch decides to ram his way through the cars. That kind of randomization is really fun and interesting. Um, and it does make your multiple playthroughs feel different when those things actually take place. It's also a good level of difficulty, I think. It's uh, it's a good challenge on Death Sentence, especially as a solo player. So I actually think it's going to go just in behind the bank heist. It just doesn't have that same iconic factor. Brooklyn Bank is, is more of the same, in my opinion. It's a, it's a great bank heist. I love that it's set at, at Christmas. I think it was it's probably the most important of the Christmas heists. Of course, it's when things start getting a little bit deeper with the uh, the secret. This is this is really the start of it, Brooklyn Bank. Um, so it, it brought us some some great narrative after Bane went missing. And um, this heist is, is a perfect blend of difficulty, I would say. The, the outdoor sections are really hard, the indoor sections are quite easy, so you play around your strengths and weaknesses on those different, uh, at those different times. And again, a lot of randomization, heist with lots of randomization are fun. They're fun to replay, um, different ways to enter the vault, different ways to escape. It's it's a really good heist. There's there's not that much more that needs to be said. It's short, sweet, tight, just like Alaskan deal. Um, the complexity in the heist comes from the randomization. So I'm gonna put it in A. There's a lot of, a lot of Bs in A right now. Um, I don't, I don't entirely know where I would drop it in. 
maybe right next to its Brooklyn brother in Brooklyn 1010. Bullock's Mansion, one of the most impressive looking payday heists. This was released for update 200. This was a hugely exciting release. I think everyone was awaiting this heist. And um, it didn't disappoint. For me, it's an S tier heist. I love it. Um, not only are there different approaches to, to the way in, to how you want to stealth it, to maybe how you want to go about the actual lab sections, depending on which areas you try and break through to get into the inner sanctum. This again actually has a pretty functional puzzle. It's not overly difficult once you've wrapped your head around it, but it's sort of a language puzzle to actually get into the inner sanctum. It's an assassination objective on a single target, but you don't have to fight a, a daft bullet bullet sponge boss which i actually think is preferable in most cases there's little secrets like the shark you can release that the, the decor is amazing this is a beautiful looking heist um there's not much else to say really the escapes are both really cool they both have great elements to them um it's very replayable as a result bullets match is fantastic uh it's not as good as the big bang it didn't come up with as many innovative ideas but it it took everything that made big bang good and it, it ran with it, and in some cases probably even expanded upon those things. The, the only real downside of this heist is that it doesn't run well on everyone's machine. So get yourself an Apex Gaming PC. Um, <laughs> I'll talk more on that a little later on. Uh, Car Shop is up next. This is a very standard stealth heist. Uh, driving mechanics, of course, can hold it back. Um, it can't be ECM rushed, but it can be rushed on lower difficulties because the uh, point of no return is extended. I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, the dialogue in this house is really funny. If you listen to the, uh, the like civilians in conversation, I, I don't think that attention to detail gets enough notice when talking about heists in tier lists. Um, but it's, it's such a standard quintessential payday two stealth heist it, it can't go anywhere above b or, or below b it, it doesn't add an awful lot to the story it was just here's another cool heist give it a go have fun and, and you will car shop is a fun short heist cook off now cook off is a part of rats um people love this heist for a good reason if you're looking to farm money or experience it's not the most efficient way but it's it's up there for money in particular um i find it repetitive at this point and i actually would rather do a holdout Nine times out of ten on the cook-off these days. So I'm going to put it in C tier, um, right by Art Gallery. I mean, the, the, the heists that take a single part of a larger heist, I can't really put too high up on the uh, the list, in my opinion, because they simply aren't as good as the, the real deal. So expect both Framing Frame and Rats to come in slightly higher than these two. Counterfeit. Now, this heist used to be stealthable, but actually it follows a sort of pseudo-stealth set up i think this is uh, of course a classic heist is it the first classic heist we're talking about yeah it is um it's a good classic heist it's 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 very solid it was added actually in the dlc to payday the heist and you can tell that there are a few more complex ideas to it i love the setting uh it's quite a unique looking map the um the objectives aren't overly inspired, but I love that you can do the first half in this like pseudo stealth situation and then things break. Of course, you used to be able to do the entirety of counterfeit in stealth thanks to a uh, well-discovered bug. Um, but now that that's gone, counterfeit is a stealth and loud heist all rolled up into one. It's a cool concept that I suppose we saw a little bit in Big Bank as well. But um, there's just something about counterfeit and, and possibly this is just the case with all the classics, I don't get as excited for them as, as the new Payday 2 heist. So it falls somewhere at the top of B tier for me, and, and I think you'll find a lot of those relatively high-stakes, large-scale um, classic heists will fall around the B tier. They didn't add anything to the Payday 2 story, and in some cases they just confuse the story as well. So that doesn't help matters, but I'm still glad they're here, don't, don't get me wrong, but they're difficult to, to rate higher than some of the unique ones, especially towards the end when they were being released. Curse Kill Room is, uh, it's, it's pretty bad, isn't it? Like, you can just sit there and do nothing and complete the heist on, on death sentence. That's not very fun. Um, this heist would be fine. It repurposes the uh, gauntlet from within the safe house. That's fine, I don't necessarily have an issue with it. It's an event heist for Halloween. I'm glad it exists. But I never really want to play it. 
unless I'm doing it for, for some challenge video. So it's difficult to put anywhere above F. The things I like about it are pretty much limited to the pumpkin. The fact you can shoot a pumpkin and kill everything on the map, I think. That's it. Other than that, it's just a very hectic, close quarters, no cover, um, shooty heist. So I think the other thing is, if all you had to do is defend the safes and then the money was automatically secured, I'd enjoy it more. The pain of going through and securing the, the cloak of gold, it's just it's just not particularly fun, is it? So so that knocks it down from being what would probably be a D-tier heist or maybe even a C-tier heist if you got rid of that bag securing. That bag securing is so awkward and again, there's no cover. Curse Kill Room has to go into F for me. Diamond Heist, it's another classic. And like I said, it's going straight into the B tier. Um, this is a cool stealth heist. It, it, it's, I like the way they were able to take what was a stealth heist in Payday the Heist, but of course that game had completely different mechanics, and adapt it for Payday 2's mechanics. And they did so really quite impressively. In fact, I'm going to put it as, as a low A tier heist. I'm just like mentally convincing myself it's, it's better than I initially thought. It, it is. It, it's a good heist. It, it looks pretty. Um, this is a great example of when you first start the hack and you just have to wait for a hack, at least the game gives you something to do. You can go around and find Ralph Garnet. You can go around and find the computers which have the code for the vault. This is exactly what, what heists, newer heists even, like um, bank heists, should have looked to do. They should have looked to keep you occupied whilst you were stealthing. Um, I don't really like the bag loop secure on this heist. It's slow and a little frustrating, which is what knocks it down and, and had me thinking B. But I do think like from a uniqueness, from an aesthetic standpoint, you know, this, this was the first skyscraper heist until Mountain Master came in. Diamond Heist is really cool. Definitely slept on a little bit. Diamond Store is the quintessential XP farm, ECM rush, not much to it. It, it was probably intended to be in the base game of Payday 2. Um, but didn't make it. I like that it added some new interesting mechanic in the alarmed glass. We never really saw that again. We saw alarmed glass, but not that it could be turned off with a keycard like that. It added a little bit of complexity to it. There's some decent RNG on this heist as well to, to change things up, to force you into different approaches. As a loud heist, it, it's lacking. I actually prefer the other like basic heists for loud, things like jewelry store. I think those maps are better designed for it. But um, as a stealth heist or as an ECM rush heist, it can be it can be fun. And at the very least, it's a very useful heist for leveling. The diamond, though, is uh, it's it's as close as you're going to get to S tier, but not quite there. I don't think it added Clover, a fantastic character, added a ton of intrigue, which they then followed up on with the diamond itself. If the diamond was a part of the secret in the end, um, it was an important heist. It, it was the Basically, you know, the sequel to Big Bank, can they follow this up? And I think in almost every way they did. Um, one of the issues I have with it is there's an entire basement area that's completely useless. It's really designed to be this is where you go in stealth and you never go there. And why would they design this entire pretty sprawling area of the map and just say, you're not going to use that? I think that's a shame. Um, I think it's got cool objectives, though. I think both in loud and stealth. Loud, it's a lot of protecting areas as you'd expect, but the spawns are quite sensible. It's one of the easier death sentence heists. I think if you want to start on death sentence, it's not a bad one to try out. Um, then the tile puzzles, really cool. I like those sorts of things. It's a memory game. It's a have a pen and paper next to you. Sometimes that's really fun in video games. Um, the diamond really nails that particular feeling. Uh, it's great in both stealth and loud. I love the diamond. It's, it's so close to S here in my opinion, but... Um, there's just a little something holding it back. Like I said, the fact it just doesn't use an entire area of it. it it's strange. And sometimes the cop spawns are a little bit odd and strange to deal with. Like the way they just keep endlessly coming through the roof. It, it means they can be easily abused with explosive builds. Um, so it's a little on the easy side, I would say. The bomb dockyard. I really dislike the bomb heist, both of them. Dockyard is much better than forest, in my opinion. But even so, dockyard is frustrating. The objectives are very slow paced in loud, um, which doesn't help it. I don't hate the map layout or anything. I don't. I don't dislike the setting. Um, I don't dislike the idea behind what we're doing. It's, it's it's good, but the bomb dockyard is it's got issues. 
it's got issues. In in the the first objective they give you is go find some key cards, basically, with absolutely no hint as to where key cards can be. So what they're saying is go explore the map, and that's fine in and of itself. But I think the objectives have to be a little more interesting and interactive than just go go have a look around. Um, then once you actually do get the boat moving, you literally just have to sit there for three minutes. Now. The idea is at this point you're stealing loot, but what if you're doing it on a very hard difficulty and you're, you're worried about setting off the last pager and failing the heist? You're just going to sit in the corner. No heist should force you to sit in the corner for three minutes. It's just not fun. Um, I think this is a little bit me just being mad at the fact I'm bad at this heist for whatever reason. Just in terms of stealth, I suck at it. I really don't know why. Um, it's not It's not dreadful, but it's not great either. I'm going to just drop it in somewhere around Aftershock, probably just after Aftershock. The Dragon Heist was another one of the uh, the new heists added in the... Uh, it was actually the first of the City of Gold campaign. And um, in terms of its setting in Chinatown, brilliant. Um, on the surface, this heist is, is sensational. It has one glaring fault, though, in my opinion. You have this, this great setting. So the streets look cool. There's brilliant artwork all over the walls. The tea room itself, it's really cool. The... the um, the, the place where the auction's being ran, pretty ornate, looks fantastic. Where the actual objective is, and where we spend probably 80% of the heist, is a bland warehouse. And that sucks, because we could just be heisting around this really interesting map, but instead we chill out in a bland warehouse, um, which to me is its greatest issue, but both in stealth and in loud. It's just, it could be any heist because of how the objectives are set up, and I think that's a real shame. But um, I do think there's some interesting objectives to it, both in loud and stealth. There's a little bit of a puzzle going on with the clocks, um, or if you do it in loud, there's the uh, the gas, of course, that gets filtered into the room that you can stop or you can uh, just live with, if that's how you want to play it. Um, but it just it, it's just such a shame we spend very little time out on the streets where the heist looks phenomenal. I think the, uh, the the cool delivery method that you can spend lots of assets on is sadly really inefficient. Like, Why go out your way to make this cool asset that lets you approach the heist differently and then make it not very good? Seems like a shame to me. Um, but I do like the escape. I like the fact that you're able to secure the C4 in loud, that, that they were trying to blow you up with and actually blast your way out through the, through the rear of the... Um, the auction house itself. Now, it's actually probably a slightly more dangerous way to go because there's bulldozers and snipers in your way, but uh, it's still cool that that option exists. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention about the Dragon Heist, and I, I can't remember what it is. It's uh, it, it isn't a bad heist at all, but it isn't it isn't a great heist either. It, it's it's wasted potential. Oh yeah, I wanted to mention the story. Um, hidden behind Cantonese dialogue is the entirety of the City of Gold campaign story. Um, and it's kind of cool that a tiny portion of the community gets to find that out. But at the same time, there should be more clues that help you find that out without having perfect Cantonese fluency. For the, the City of Gold story episode, obviously I, I looked into it and it's huge. That information's phenomenal. If I'd actually known that the entire time, I probably could have predicted the next three heists. But I didn't. Um, so I'm not sure where I stand on that. Yeah, it's cool. It was fantastic that they got them doing this perfect Cantonese. You know, they they, they had the voice actors that could pull that off. But um, it was a little bit... Uh, it wasn't so inclusive when it comes to people understanding the story. Election Day is up next. And this is another um, heist that, that brought a new concept in that was never followed up on. I think I understand why. I think the idea of having a heist day that you only see if you approach day one in a certain way is is pretty uh, resource inefficient like a lot of people might not even know about plan c because they always do day one the correct way um and so lots of people don't get to actually play a heist that they put time designing um but i do think the concept's really cool so on day one you can tag the truck correctly you can tag the truck incorrectly and that will dictate which heist you get on day two both have their pros and cons um which is fantastic. I think the, uh, the the Plan C heist is actually really slept on. I think it's quite fun, even though it's just a basic drilling heist. I think the map layout in particular is is fantastic, and I think thematically it does a great job. Election Day introduces Mayor McKendrick, who is a, a vaguely important character and, and does further the story in those early days. Um, 
And I actually like all three days. Day one's cool. It's mainly a rush heist from my perspective. Day two in, in stealth is really fun. Uh, plan B, I should say. Uh, I, I really like stealth in that heist. It's the best way to, to farm up XP if you've seen my uh, general infamy farming approach. So election day is uh, it's an A tier heist. It's, it's not top of A tier. It's, it's somewhere around here, I would say. Firestarter. Now, this one actually contains a bank heist, so it's impossible for me not to put it at, like at least at bank heist level, I would say. Um, day one's cool. I, I like that you can do it in stealth. I think that's fantastic, whether that was intended or not. It's, it's, it's cool that it's always been left in there. Day two at the FBI offices was one of those first, like, ooh, this is a difficult um, stealth heist, but you are rewarded for doing it in stealth. I think that is quintessentially what stealth should be all about. Um, and then day three is just a bank heist, and we know that bank heists are pretty cool and iconic. So Firestarter's right in there. I don't think it's an awful lot better than bank heist. You know, it's you can complain that day three is just a reuse of assets, I suppose. But um, no, I, I think Firestarter stands on its own as, as, a, as a pretty cool and interesting heist. And uh, it's the first one that gives you the hint that maybe the rat is is Hector. All of Hector's missions are pretty cool. I, I like that retroactively we're able to see, wow, this guy really was stitching us up. First World Bank, the probably the first heist ever designed. I, I don't know about that, but I imagine it was, right? This, this heist is um, another classic coming back from Payday the Heist, and it's going into S tier. Um, it's... Like Bank Heist, it's just as iconic, but it's on a much larger scale with differing approaches, depending on whether you want to stealth it, whether you want to go loud. Um, it's a wonderful playground. It's one of the best holdouts in the game, in my opinion. And um, even better, it has Overdrill. It has a, a really cool secret on there that, that you can do, spend 30 minutes of your life doing to, to get massive rewards, unlock an achievement, and hopefully have fun in the process. And, you know, very few heists have secrets like that. So First World Bank definitely gets a, a bonus there. I think it's a shame it isn't really tied into the story in any way, but this heist gets a pass because it is such a classic. The Bomb Forest, it sucks. Everyone hates this heist. It doesn't have to suck so much. It doesn't have to be so bad. They, they There are elements of it that are really good. I think the forest in and of itself is cool. At night, it's really atmospheric. Maybe one of the most atmospheric heists in the game. Um... But for some reason, the entire place is tilted. <laughs> and whilst a fine concept on the surface, they should have done something about the way falling damage works on it. Because you can just be running down, jump, as is a habit of mine, to be honest, crouch jumping for movement. And you've just jumped and killed yourself straight into the abyss. Doesn't make any sense. You've literally just tripped a little bit down a hill. Um, suddenly, you're straight into custody. It's strange. Um, the other obvious issue... I don't want to complain too much about them, but the snipers on this high star, they spawn from basically every corner. They are miles away. So if you don't have a long range weapon yourself, you're going to really struggle. There's incredibly limited cover on this heist. So you're going to get hit by them more than likely. And um, nothing's really impressive. We, we fill the, first of all, you have to find the bomb itself, which can take ages and be frustrating. Um, more fiddliness with having to drop ladders down. That's what this heist is really. It's a fiddly heist. Um, but then once you're in, you, you, you drill some water, blow some C4, but it's not really much of a spectacle. And then it's one of three escapes, but none of them are that impressive either. So again, it's wasted potential. that They've created this fantastic looking playground and just thrown lots of really nasty things in it. So Bomb Forest, whilst it's not an F tier heist, it is a D tier heist. It definitely is. It's worse, worse than Border Crossing because at least Border Crossing has some structure to the gameplay loop. It, it, the actual combat feels fine. Bomb Forest is just a frustration in many, many ways. Four stores. This is an example of me probably rating heists that are very simplistic, but released with the game a little bit too highly. I mean, I think just like Diamond Store, it's just a B-tier heist. Um, Like, you can't complain about a heist being too simplistic if that's what the heist is intended to do. Really, this is a, a tutorial heist. We didn't have tutorials back in the day, so... This was a simple, this is how you go in, sneak, open up safes, and find money. Now, of course, it's pretty much trivialized on Overkill and Below these days. It's just an ECM type rush. Um, great way to start your infamy. But uh, it is actually a pretty cool, well-laid-out heist that has some legs in terms of being a multiplayer map, which is why it's one of the, the maps that they, they've honed in on for uh, Crime War. 
So yeah, four stores is, is not poorly designed, if you ask me. It does the job really well, but it's not impressive in any way. And, and it, it was kind of indicative of the smaller scale of the initial Payday 2 heist. Framing frame, though. This is an interesting one. Um, I'm not putting it in F. I'm, I'm thinking. Because framing frame has day one of art gallery, which is, we already know, it's a fine heist, but I think it's it's slightly lacking in loud. Really, you are meant to go about it in stealth, and I don't necessarily like that. Day two, then, is pretty cool in that it varies depending on whether you did go stealth or went loud, which rewards you for playing the heist in the, the way you're meant to instead of taking what, in some ways, I think is the easier route and, and going loud because... It is an easy loud heist. Um, and then day three is a kind of kind of awesome whilst also being a, a mess. It's such a cool setting. You can see the White House. Bane talks about it. They, this is when they first hinted at the final heist in Payday 2's like, main campaign. Um, but then the, the first objective, which you, you get rewarded, by the way, one of the few heists that rewards you for finding lots of paintings at the start, you get rewarded for how you do on day one. That's brilliant. It, you can use the cameras and the paintings not only to spot guards but also to spot the equipment you're looking for and that's fine they can be really tricky to see it's a bit too dark if you ask me in the heist which can lead to you a lot of frustration when you can't find the laptop that's perfectly camouflaged um but if you get past that the big frustration for me is how randomization kills this heist one of the three options that you can have while stealthing it is atrocious virtually uncompletable and if you are going to complete it it's going to take you a very long time and you have to move one bag at a time and there's a lot of bags to move it's very time consuming very frustrating it's not the fun part of stealth um so framing frame has that frustration it has that randomization that's more frustrating than it is interesting as a result of all the bags you have to move later on as a loud heist it's actually absolutely fine it's, it's a cool playground it has possibly the most useless vantage point ever added in a heist but i can't be mad at it for that so this one's an interesting one there's like a, a ton of pros and cons with it but it, i still think it, it, it goes into the b tier um the alesso heist is simply better than it in my opinion only marginally because it's a fairer stealth heist framing frame has that slight element of unfairness which is difficult for me to to, to want to promote Go Bank. So Go Bank is another concept heist. Um, yes, it's a reused map and a homage to, to Counter Strike. That's fine. I, I won't get mad at it for, for being that. Um, but it's a concept in how much can we randomize? This heist randomizes so much that there's even a one percent chance the vault will just be open. And you can wall straight in, and that's amazing. Not enough heists do that. I'm amazed that this wasn't a successful test. Like. They tested a lot of randomization here in terms of um, how you stealth it when you get the phone calls toward the end, um, when the heist first starts, whether there's an armored transport vehicle, whether there's police at the gas station, like I mentioned already, whether the vault is already open. That sort of randomization is awesome. Surely everyone loved that. Yet we never saw it to the same extent again. Like GoBank is the most randomized heist in the game. Um, now, I don't like this heist in stealth. I, I think it's a bit frustrating that you can clear the heist from guards, use all your pages in doing so, because you kind of have to. Otherwise, there's no way you're, you're getting in. This is a control heist. Destroy all the cameras, control the vault, get the key cards in. Um, but that's pretty frustrating that you can randomly have a chance, a pretty high chance, of additional security guards with pages showing up and uh, ruining stealth. I think that's annoying. It's also maybe the first heist to add lasers. Lasers kind of suck, especially in a game with as much desync as Payday. But um, I do think it's a pretty cool heist overall, even as a stealth heist. It's a unique experience. And as a loud heist, it's it's quite fun, um, despite the snipers. So I'm going to put it somewhere around. The other two bank heists, uh, probably just marginally below them, um, even though the randomization is awesome and I wish we, we had more of it. Goat Sim, F tier, I hate this heist. I don't. Goat Simulator is actually a pretty cool heist. Um, yeah, it's a silly gimmick heist. It doesn't play any role in the story. It's another like crossover with a game you did not expect, where the two worlds don't necessarily mix quite as well as John Wick and Hardcore Henry. But it's actually got lots of good elements to it. Um, very few heists take you on such an expansive set of objectives in day one. I think this heist, more so than any other, actually makes use of the vehicle in it. The vehicle doesn't feel so cumbersome, it feels worthwhile to use. And um, it's the kind of heist where, when you know a lot about it and can min-max it, I think I, I know lots of the best DSOD players out there think this is the best heist in the game. 
and I know, or at least it's their favorite heist, and I know why. I, I can see it. I don't think it's the best heist in the game. I think there's a lot of frustration about it um, because it's a bag-carrying heist. But the actual objectives to get the loot are pretty fun, pretty cool, really diverse, take you all over the map. Um, it really falls down as a death sentence heist because it's so wide open. Cops can spawn from basically every angle and shoot you across the map where you can't shoot back. Um, because there's no damage drop off, that's problematic. But on lower difficulties, that's not so much of an issue. And um, I think it is a, a really interesting heist. I'm glad Goat Simulator exists. Whereas some heists, I think, God, that was a lot of wasted potential. The Bomb Forest stands out. Whereas Goat Simulator... It's pretty good. I haven't even talked about day two where, again, the, the car escape is really intense and it's a surprisingly good use of the driving mechanic, which up until then was was, was not anyone's favourite mechanic. Um, I'm not a massive fan of getting loads of goats into a uh, into a cage and sending them up, but I can see the humour in, in the situation. The, the that style of uh, loot secure is, is better than carrying them across the entire map as well. So it's got that going for it. And then the actual escape, as I said, it's really intense. I like the part where you defend the bridge. Things can get really touch and go on higher difficulties. But that is like, it's the apex of difficulty in Payday 2, I would say, Goat Simulator. Um, I think some people would argue Lab Rats. But I think Goat Simulator is actually a harder, more balanced and thought out experience. Um, so I, I think it gets too much stick. I do find bag moving simulators, which Goat Simulator can be described as frustrating, but Goat Sim is, it, it gets enough right that I can forgive it for that. I'm going to put it in A. I'm going to put it not even at the bottom of A. I'm going to put it just above Election Day here. Uh, I think if I sat on the fence and gave it B, no one would be happy. I'm at least going to come down on one side. I'm going to put it in the A tier. The Golden Green Casino, though, this was another extremely exciting heist when it came out. One of Overkill's big releases. Um, we got Sokol with it, who was a cool character who played a part in the heist, which was always nice when, when the character kind of canonically was involved in the heist they were released on. Um, it was Dentist's last heist that he, uh, he contracted us for, and it left us with so many questions that would take years to be answered. But I don't mind that. I think it was a phenomenal tease for the future. Now, it's a very difficult stealth heist. I'm going to put it in right behind the diamond for me. It, it's, it's a really difficult stealth heist, and I think at times the objectives are designed in a bit of a frustrating way that have you walking through areas that are, are difficult to get through to the extent where sometimes it finds like it feels like the randomization of the heist is causing you to fail, um, which is why it's not S tier for me. And as a loud heist, it's massive it's grand there are lots of different approaches i think this might have the most pre-planning out of any heist option in the game but then the frustration is that the drill itself is annoying to deal with you know we have to keep feeding it water we have to keep making sure it stays plugged in in two different areas i think maybe three different areas if you don't have the uh if you don't have the pre-planning asset and it can be just a little bit annoying a little bit tedious i found in certain challenge runs this heist was a frustration but at the same time, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous lucky heist. It also added a new mechanic in the uh, sort of post-pre-planning casing mode. Civilian mode, that's what it's called. Casing mode has always existed, but civilian mode was new. And it let you sort of explore the casino and, uh, and get a good lay of the land before going anywhere. And that was a, a fine addition as well. Um, nowhere near as innovative and important as Big Bank, but just like the Diamond, part of a phenomenal series. Some of the best heist pay they ever saw. Green Bridge is a classic, a return of a classic with some nasty RNG, one of the most frustrating achievements in the game. Um, but it played a pretty important part in the story and the search for Kento. And I think it was one of the better repurposing um, moments for, for the classic heists. Because essentially, I, I would guess Green Bridge never happened canonically anymore. It doesn't make any sense if it did uh, within Payday the Heist. That's how I told the story anyway. Um, eh. I don't think Overkill thought about it. They just had to bring back all the classics at that point. It was already decided. Um, I'm not a big fan of it being such a rainy heist, but uh, I can see some people would like that. It is a very different atmosphere it creates. Um, the actual objectives are okay. Like I said, some nasty RNG defending on the top of the scaffolding can be quite difficult. I, I like that difficulty, to be honest. 
It's an escort mission, and escort missions are always frustrating, though. Uh, I'd say that loses it quite a lot of points. <laughs> um, I hate how escorts work in uh, Payday 2. They should not stop the second a cop moves close to them. They should just keep walking, and there should be a, a, a meter or something that that or an, a time in which the guards or the cops have to interact with the escort to stop them from walking because otherwise it's so so frustrating um green bridge falls somewhere at the bottom of the b category though it's one of those where a lot of good a little bit of bad um and it sort of evens itself out overall okay let's get on to heat street we've really been at this for an hour um i think heat street is a better heist than counterfeit uh, oh, sorry, it's a better heist than Green Bridge, and it's somewhere around where Counterfeit's at. Probably marginally better than Counterfeit. Um, whilst in the storyline, it's kind of crazy that we're chasing Matt Roscoe once again, uh, five years apart. Um, I think they did a really good job with it. It's a fast-paced heist that turns then into a slower-paced holdout heist when we burn him out. Um, I think it's hilarious that you can just wait out for 30 minutes. That's such a nice touch. Uh, I mean, I'd rather not, but I do think it's a, a funny variation on the heist. Um, a lot of the Payday the Heist remakes are quite linear, but that can be good as long as it's a well thought out gauntlet. And so as a challenging death sentence loud heist, Heat Street really ticks all the boxes for me. Um, in fact, just like the Diamond Heist, I'm going to put it in, in the same A category. A is A is where most heists are finding themselves. I think most heists are, are pretty fun. I, you know, enjoy Payday too. So Heat Street falls just above the Diamond Heist actually, in my opinion. Hell's Island, another quintessential A heist. Pretty high up in A as well, I think. Somewhere around Alaskan deal and boiling point, in my opinion. Maybe just beneath them. Because it's not as well designed, I don't think, just as a heist. But it's so important to the storyline. Um, and it tells the story really well. It, of course, announces the dentist as our nemesis uh, in some of the most creepy and well-recorded dialogue in the game. And um, then it's a... Yet another gauntlet, head from the start type heist with a fair few different environments to fight in. Decently enjoyable objectives. They're not loads of fun. Really, they're just ways to, to force you to slow down at certain parts of the gauntlet so you get into more extended gunfights, but that's all right. Um, I love the setting. The prison setting is so cool and unique. We, we never go to anywhere like it. Um, we actually get to see Bane in person. The story is moved along to the point where we actually see Kento die. Um, yeah, I don't think up until this point we had as many revelations in one heist. Maybe Henry's Rock's up there as well. and It's the next one we're about to talk about. I'd, I'd say, actually, we could comfortably talk about these two together. But for me, they're like on, on a very similar level. I think Henry's Rock is marginally better, but... Um, Henry's Rock, of course, teased the dentist as the nemesis very heavily. It introduced Kento as the leader of Murky Water, which was huge, especially for Jiro and his storyline. Um, and it also took us to, just like Hell's Island, a really unique compound. Um, I suppose it's a little bit similar to where we went for Beneath the Mountain, but it, different enough that, um, that, that I think it took a lot of people by surprise and, and acted out as a really unique heist. The reason why Henry's Rock is a little bit better is the linearity of Hell's Island compared to the uh, randomization of Henry's Rock. Different objectives every time. Every playthrough feels a little bit different. Um, I'd say Henry's Rock is the harder heist, uh, almost without a doubt. Oh, and also Hell's Island does a good job of doing the escort objective with Locke in a less frustrating way. Instead of forcing you to pick up kills around him, instead of just, you know, desperately hoping someone doesn't walk into him, AI pathing is weird. Um... But yeah, as I was saying, Hell's Island's finished. Let's talk more about Henry's Rock. It's it's a massive sprawling heist where whilst they don't use as much map space, because there are different sort of compartments you can end up in and, and different objectives in those areas, again, it, it feels like a few heists rolled into one, which is always good to see within these one-day heists. Um, you could see an awful lot of effort was going into the heist at these point to, to not only make a, a cohesive story, but also um, make it fit around really good, intense, and often difficult gameplay. And and that was this was like I said, outside of maybe the golden era, which I'd say is Big Bank, the Diamond, Golden Grin. This was this was peak payday. Um, as we were coming towards the White House in the end, it was about as exciting as Payday 2's uh, two ever got, at least from a narrative standpoint. And and the heist matched that. 
Hotline Miami, it's a fan favorite. It's one of my favorites. It was another, it's in that, it's in that exact same category with Golden Grin and the Diamond. In fact, I maybe believe it's a stronger heist. I think the fact it can't be stealthed is, is okay because, you know, it, of course it was a, a reference, more than just a reference to Hotline Miami as a game. Of course it had to be violent and aggressive. Um, the music carries this one. I haven't talked an awful lot about heist music because, you know, some people listen to random tracks whilst heisting and it it doesn't always play a part. But this one, it has to, right? Everyone listens to the Hotline tracks on Hotline Miami. They are both absolute bangers. Um, Story-wise, it's kind of interesting. Of course, they were trying to link it in to, to the dentist and there's a lot that you can infer from why we go after the commissar. But this is more of a... a a clean gameplay experience. Early on, there's a lot of running around, doing objectives, trying to deal with the snipers, which are much closer and easier to deal with, which I'm grateful about. Um, when we get down to the basement, it does slow gameplay down a little bit on day one. It's not as exciting, and that's probably why I couldn't bring, bring myself to put it to the S tier. But on day two, it's even more high octane. It's all about rushing quickly to the top of the roof and then defending what is a incredibly claustrophobic space with a drill. Whilst choppers come around and try and blast you out, yes, they end up helping you because you can just leave the fire there. But it, it's still that sort of level, that, that level up that we saw with Big Bang and of like, yeah, the stakes are a lot higher now. The heist is so much more intriguing and there's a lot more to them. Um, and Hotline Miami really typifies that, whilst also being an absolutely spot-on crossover with a fantastic game. Hotston Breakout. I, I'd say for years this was my favourite heist. Um, another loud-only heist, which is fine by me, as long as it does the job. This was the most excited I've ever been for a heist and for an update. We got a brand new skill tree in Fugitive here, and we got to immediately try out that Fugitive skill tree in the Hotston Breakout which was brilliant. Not only does High see you earn one of the best characters in the game in Hoxton, um, it was huge for the story, it brought the dentist into play. And um, day one is a brilliant gauntlet, in my opinion, very challenging on death sentences. It's really the heist that taught me you need to use concussion grenades. Um, but it's, it's still, even on lower difficulties, it's such a fantastically fun romp through the streets. Um, it's the best example, I think, of them creating an exciting trailer, live action trailer, and managing to perfectly convert that into the gameplay within the heist. And then day two, we go straight to the FBI officers, equally exciting. Um, I think it goes here, just above Bullets Mansion. Yeah, day two at the officers, it, it's it's exciting, especially when you're sent out by Hobson to do the, the different objectives. It's quite challenging. Again, it's all close quarters. Uh, it's not the most fun thing on the planet just to stare at a power box, but I don't tend to play it that way. If they turn off the power box, whatever, I just get to have more fun on what is a really fun playground, Hotston Breakout Day 2. So, phenomenal heist. Definitely one of the best in the game. Hotston Revenge, though, which was originally intended to be a Day 3 of Hotston Breakout. Um, fortunately, it wasn't because I think it would have really hurt the pacing of that heist. It's not as good. Um, it did give us a, a phenomenal revelation in the Hector was the uh, the rat, and I love the way that was all teased throughout the heist, especially if you were stealthing it early on. You start listening to these tapes, putting two and two together and going, my god, the guy who contracted the hat, the heist rats is the rat. Who'd have thought it? Um, but it's good. It, it all made sense. It's all easy to piece together. Um, and I'm amazed more people didn't guess Hector before this heist came out, actually. So, narrative top marks. Actual gameplay, not as good. I think as a loud heist, it's really frustrating. It's another one that's not designed as a loud heist. A lot of the enemies fall outside the map, which is never great for ammo, like ammo uh, low builds. It's a problem. Um, as a stealth heist, it is much better, and I like the randomization there. It's quite interesting that there's a lot of randomization in stealth, whereas in loud, it's just like, get the drill. Good luck, mate. Um... But this is a great example of the stealth being probably A tier and the loud being C tier and me just having to put it in B tier. Because that's how that works, right? I'm just going to put it in ahead of framing frame because it's a little less unfair at times. Jewelry store. Uh, 
I mean, what a classic, right? This was the quintessential ECM rush heist, but in another sense, it introduced a new mechanic to players really well, in that stealth it was no longer just about staying out of sight. It was about civilians taking hostages, controlling crowds, working as a team, and, and moving bags. So Jewelry Store introduced an awful lot, more than I think people realise, and it did so in a really clever way to tutorialise it, because like I mentioned, there were no tutorials back then. So I'm going to put it right in where the other sort of basic ones are. Um, though it's iconic, it's just no one's excited for Jewelry Store, are they? I can appreciate what it did, but nowadays it's, uh, it, it's a thing of the past in, certain, in, in, in a sense. It is, however, I think one of the most up there with um, Harvest and Trustee. That image of the jewelry store, or possibly Ukrainian job, if that's the variant you're playing, is like, ah yes, that's payday too. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Lab rats, F tier, hate it. No, I don't. It's, it's just like um, Goat Simulator. I think Goat Simulator is a much better heist, but um, in many ways, Lab Rats is similar. It's, uh, it's a heist that gets a lot better the more you know about it. And when I was doing the Halloween challenge run last year, I learned a lot about Lab Rats. And I think in my esteem, it went up from, from a D tier to at least a low B tier. And that's where it's going to go today. Um, it can be unfair. It, it, can, it can be unfair. It can feel unfair. It's a big bag moving heist, but it, with a real twist. You know, it's all about putting three bags into the right location. Um, there's a not puzzly element to it, but a, a fun element to the bag moving, which there often isn't. Um, now it's obviously very wide open, there's not a lot of cover, and there's far too much jumping parkour stuff done from, from the rooftops, uh, so to speak. Obviously Lab Rats is a cool concept in that it takes rats or cook off and shrinks everything down or shrinks us down whilst everything else is the same size, so it's a, it's a miniature version of that. Um, which is cool, funny, and, and it was big effort for what was a, uh, just a Halloween event heist at the time that wasn't intended to even stick around. But, um, people give this heist a, a bad reputation because of how difficult they find it and they see it as the wall to getting the death sentence mask. I don't think that's a reason to hate a heist. I think that's a reason to appreciate there's more to learn and, and maybe this heist has some tricks and secrets to it. And whether they were actually intended by Overkill or not, it has loads of tricks and secrets. There's so many different ways to be clever, to be in cover while securing the bags, to climb up without using things like the zip lines, which really are there as uh, traps to get you killed, to be honest. Um, and when I was doing the challenge at Halloween, I learned those tricks specifically to get over the size because I physically couldn't. And by the time I'd learned them, I could. So... It really was. That's the Dark Souls satisfaction for me, you know. That's climbing the mountain by getting better. Um, so it is a bit of a get good heist. But I I'm glad one of those or a few of those exist within the game. Now, it's it's not. It was never designed to be as, as complex and interesting as Goat Simulator. But with the, the, the relatively like few resources they have putting it together, it's a... It's decent enough heist. It, it gets far too much stick just for being difficult. And I, I kind of like the spider and the necro cloaker was introduced as well. So, yeah, a couple of other things worth mentioning. More Crasher. It's another icon. And it's a, it's a cool heist because it added a new concept that, again, was never really explored. The destruction mechanic. So this was all about doing as much damage as we possibly could. Um, I liked it. It's a real muscle job. I'm amazed there's not more muscle jobs. It was sort of that a heist that straddled that line, though, between sort of petty crook with the Vlad stuff and then what we'd been used to in Payday, the heist. Um, More Crasher also gets some bonus points for being stealthable, which is insane if you think about what the inject uh, objectives involve. But I think it's awesome that a heist like this is somehow stealthable. I think it's more awesome, not on Overkill's part as the developers, but on the, the player's part for discovering, wait, we can do this. Um... So yeah, it has an awful lot going for it. it. It struggles from being an old heist, relying on old mechanics, and, uh, you know, it's not the most interesting escape. There's not a lot of loot, which doesn't make much sense when there should be so much we can steal instead of just destroying. Um, but it's, uh, once again, it's a heist that was turned into a holdout. 
a pretty good playground for gunfights. So uh, more Crasher Falls just above Jewelry Store. Not as iconic, but definitely a much more fun and, and fleshed out heist. Meltdown is not a brilliant heist, is it? Um, it takes place on the Shadow Raid map. Kind of cool that we went back to somewhere we'd already heisted. But Shadow Raid was designed for stealth, and it was well built for stealth, really. Um, and the map was not designed to, to function in loud. Yes, it's been massively expanded, and, and I think that's cool as well. Um, but it's a vehicle, it, it's, a, it's a messy vehicle heist, and that's never a whole lot of fun. I, I love the fact that we're stealing nukes. That's crazy. Again, it's an upping of the stakes. It's, it's such a Vlad heist in that sense. And that's why, you know, I wouldn't put it all the way at the bottom of... of of D like this, I'd at least put it above the, the bloody biker heist. Um, and maybe I'd put it in the same tier as Aftershock, to be honest. Like, they're, they're similar Vlad heights. They're both daft scenarios that Vlad's put us in. He's brilliant throughout, but the actual gameplay doesn't, doesn't match. Um, Meltdown's just another sniper frenzy, high frustration levels. The driving never feels great. The nukes are so heavy, even though I love the concept of what we're stealing. Um, on harder difficulties in particular, it, it gets extra frustrating. And, and within challenge runs, this has been a big frustration for me in the past. So now I'm going to I'm gonna stick with my guns and, and hold Meltdown in D, but definitely better than the biker heist. Screw the biker heist. Uh, Murky Station, Jimmy's other heist. It's it's okay. This is like a this is like an add-on. You know, Boiling Point was the, the real hardcore Henry content, and then Murky Station was just a little uh, a little something to tie over the stealth fans who hadn't had anything in a while. Um, there are some new concepts added here, things like the, the flying drone cams, which I find really frustrating, to be honest. Um, but this heist is incredibly simplistic, but not really to a fault, because it, it, it's a fun map to run around. It's got a good layout to it. So because the map design's good, I don't have any issue with the um, objectives being incredibly simplistic. So it's actually just a high satisfaction heist, in my opinion. It can be done quite quickly, and when pulled off well, you feel like a good heister. So Murky Station ticks a lot of boxes. It's going to fall in just above Greenbridge. Nightclub. Another of Vlad's um, interesting heists early on. Low stakes once again. Um, for me, it's just... It, it, it might still be quite iconic to other players, but it's just not got that same that same ring to it as the other heists that, that released with the game. It's incredibly simplistic, uh, maybe to a fault. And um, the thing is, at the end of the day, it's just find a keycard or use an ECM and, and get in and then drill, right? In stealth or loud. Either way, the objectives are really not that exciting. It's not a very fun map to have gunfights on, unfortunately. The one thing it did quite well and introduced was slightly more complex assets that, that had more value. Um, but outside of that, Nightclub wasn't overly innovative. Um, and so it, it probably is only getting this high up in C because it is, it is a bit of an icon of Payday 2. But, but from my perspective, it's just not got enough about it. No Mercy, it's a cool and, and fun classic heist that was really well repurposed from its original concept in uh, Payday the Heist. Obviously this was a uh, Left 4 Dead reference heist, it still has that in it, still has enough references to Valve, to Left 4 Dead. Um, but now it's the heist that explains why Bane is dying, which is a huge deal. It fits into the story in a really interesting way as an actually told flashback heist. Um, they play with that in funny ways, because obviously certain characters shouldn't be there, like Duke, they played into the time traveler joke, um, which was really clever. So I think from a narrative standpoint, No Mercy nails it. Um, way better than the other classics from that perspective, because it actually makes some degree of sense why we're playing it. I think others should have been explained as flashbacks as well. I think it would have made the story more cohesive. Um, so I'm actually going to drop it in just above Heat Street here. For now, because I'm still thinking, I, it, it's a simplistic heist, but it can be pseudo-stealthed a little bit like counterfeit for the first half before going loud. And I think that's cool. And whilst it's not my favorite way to play the heist, it's uh, it's cool that the variety of, of approach is there. It's a little bit frustrating that there's so much randomization in the second half when it comes to finding the patient and then finding a, a positive blood sample. 
But um, because it's such an exciting, intense close quarters heist, that randomness never feels tedious. There's always so much for you to concentrate on. It's on the easier side, but only if you have a high DPS build. So keep that in mind. Um, which means for people who, who just enjoy going to town and testing out their builds, no mercy is actually a really good option. And there's no snipers, so actually S tier. No, we'll 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 hold it right there, right above Heat Street. Panic Room. This was my nemesis for a long while, but I think I finally uh, sussed it out after all the time I spent suffering um, up against Panic Room on my uh, no shooting challenge. It's uh, it's actually quite a fun heist, I think. The snipers are a annoying objective for certain builds, as I've already mentioned, but they're just a fun combat challenge if you're well set up to receive them. Um, I don't particularly love the soaring objectives or how long we have to wait around for bile, but actually, once again, this is a good playground heist. Um, I love the way the cops spawn on the rooftops and jump across and can be launched off. It's it's fun to play with those ragdoll physics. It's it's a satisfying heist in many respects. If you're like sniping on the rooftop and you start hitting lots of good shots, Panic Room scratches a lot of itches for me in that sense. Um, but it, it does absolutely nothing when it comes to furthering the story. Like I said, it can limit you depending on your build, which is never ideal. But it's it's still a good B tier heist. Um, I forgive you, Panic Room, for all the suffering you've given me in the past. Oh, my voice is definitely on its way out. Um, Prisoner Nightmare is up next. Another Halloween heist that uh, does the job pretty well. It's actually like weirdly story relevant. There's a, there's a lot of whispers and, and character dialogue lines on this heist that are really important to, to give some backstory and context to certain characters, which is cool because it you know, doesn't really fit within the story outside of that. Um, it was... A fresh map for Halloween, which is cool. It was the first time it was a completely fresh new idea within the map. Of course, Cook-Off, uh, not Cook-Off, sorry, Lab Rats was um, newly designed, but it was taking a previous concept, whereas Prison Nightmare is just its own thing. Um, and I mentioned before, actually, that uh, Hell's Island was the first prison heist. I mean, it isn't. Prison Nightmare was. Now, they're very unique, different prisons, but uh, Prison Nightmare also gets the atmosphere just right, I would say. I think out of the uh, out of all the Halloween heists, it's got to be the best of them. Um, the actual wheel and the randomization and the necro cloaker and stuff, I could take or leave. I actually think this would be a more fun heist if they went for more of a horrific element setting in in this creepy prison. But that isn't really the overkill way. Uh, instead, they went for uh, ridiculousness with this massive cloaker. But um, even with that in mind, it's just it's a fun, well-rounded heist. The escape is a little bit of a mess. Maybe too much of a mess. Screw the snipers. Screw all the bulldozers. Um, but it's a satisfying one, one that's quite doable on DSOD as well. So definitely give Prison Nightmare a go. If, if you haven't because you think, oh, it's just another uh, event heist. These are all ridiculous or super hard because Prison Nightmare is not. Rats is another one that... that falls into the iconic category because rats was um, the farming method back in the day. Basically, you could avoid doing the first objective on any difficulty, blow up the uh, the entire place, get out of there quickly, because I'm pretty sure the van was, was there within like a minute. Um, day two, you just wouldn't have to give them anything. You could just fight them off, get the intel, and then you're already done. It was such a fast um, XP farming method. It's still okay for that. Um, you're actually better cooking these days, but back then it was like fantastic for XP and money, um, which is probably why it's remained so iconic. Or maybe it's the fact we're cooking meth with these funny ingredients and it's a bit of a Breaking Bad thing. Um, but yeah, day, day one is just cook off. Day two is a kind of interesting heist where, where we go through the deal. It's interesting in that we can um, backstab the guys we're going through the deal with, and there's a lot of variation here. This is a high randomization heist. They might already be looking to backstab you. The cops might have already uh, been preparing a bust on them, and you get caught up in the crossfire. I, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty fun and interesting, and, and Rats nails that. Then day three is relatively simplistic. It's just a case of taking out um, the Mendozas on a bus. And then fleeing or securing all the loot. Totally up to you. Obviously, these days, fleeing is probably the way most people go about it. Money is not that important. But um, 
it was a, a soft sort of tongue-in-cheek nudge that maybe Hector, the contractor, was the rat that, that had put Hotson in jail. And, uh, of course, that was the case in the end. Um, I'd say I'd say Rats does its job of being a multi-day heist with lots of escapes, by the way, that there's a high chance of escapes on this heist, which make it feel a little bit longer and it fleshes and stretches it out because otherwise it would be quite short. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's up there with the other classics like Framing Frame. Mm, I think I maybe enjoy Rats marginally more. But I do think this, this heist is sometimes a little overrated. I think this is a lot of people's S tier and, and I don't. I don't think that. I don't think there's enough to it for that. Reservoir Dogs. I once called this heist my favourite heist in the game. Um, or the best heist in the game. I probably said something that bold. It's not the best heist in the game. Um, but it nails a lot of what it wanted to get right. So it is a great Reservoir Dogs reference. I love that it takes place in reverse order. The fact that the breakup of the chronology is brilliant. And because it's done that way, we get this incredible sort of cliffhanger ending when we learn that on day one, the reason why we're in such trouble is because Bane has been taken. And this sets into motion basically the entirety of the rest of the story. And so it does so in this fantastic, referential, Quentin Tarantino-style heist. Um, but it's also like so pivotal to Payday 2's storyline. And I think that's, that's really good. I think it's it's quite impressive that they managed to nail that. So for me, I'm actually just going to drop this in above boiling point. Um, day one is is or day two, which actually takes place first, is probably more my favourite day. I think day two um, can be a little bit on the slow side comparatively, and a little frustrating when it comes to escaping. Um, half the time, you send the loot across on the zip lines, and then um, the cops just come and pick them up before you can even get down to it, unless you're playing in a big team. But uh, these are very minor gripes. Reservoir Dogs is, is such a cool heist, both in, in concept and execution. Safe House Nightmare, it's just, I'm so sorry. The event heists just, they're so gimmicky. They barely feel like payday heists. Why would I ever want to do a Safe House Nightmare unless I was doing it for a challenge run for a video? I wouldn't. It's just you have to do a specific build. If you do, it's not overly difficult. Hell, you can even break the game quite easily with just a single turret. And those are like the ways I recommend taking on Safe House Nightmare. I wouldn't really recommend glitching many other heists to get through them, but Safe House Nightmare is just so tedious. Cloakers and Headless Dozers, two of the least fun enemies in the game to fight. Here's an endless wave of them. How fun. It was so cool when it came out, um, but obviously not a, a lot of time could go into it. It came out so close to Payday's actual launch, and, and they were still trying to fix bugs and things. So it's not a huge surprise that it's, it's a simplistic and, and somewhat lacking heist. The only thing I like about it still is that it takes us to the old classic safe house that I do sorely miss. Speaking of safe houses, safe house raid it takes place on the current safe house. Um, there's just not a lot to this heist, is there? I mean, it's just a, it's just a holdout. It's a 15 minute holdout instead of a 30 minute holdout that you do within your own safe house. And all you have to do is defend two to three bags, I think, depending on the difficulty. Um, I like it to test out builds. It sadly does not run well. The safe house is poorly optimized. It's why it could never come to console. Um, so it's got that pulling it down. But I do like it as a uh, as a playhouse close quarters build tester. Um, yeah. So it, it it does it does the job it's meant to. It's not it's not meant to be overly complex or exciting. Um, it's just a shame they didn't get the optimization right. San Martin Bank, on the other hand, it's another heist that doesn't run phenomenally well, but this one's really worth it. I think San Martin is uh, another one of those pretty decent, uh, towards the bottom of A tier sort of recent DLC heist. Um, this was the second foray in the Silk Road, and I think it showed that Overkill were pretty serious about getting Payday back into development because these were, we went from loads of reused assets to loads of new assets, um, with the return of certain characters like Harudin. Um, this is an interesting heist in that it canonically went a certain way because of what happened next with Breakfast and Tijuana. I like that. I do think it, it as, as someone who, you know, prides myself on my storytelling, it, it gives me a bit more evidence when it comes to explaining the story because a lot of the time I'm, I'm firing shots in the dark. But San Martin Bank does a good job. Or I suppose Breakfast and Tijuana should really be the one that's praised for that. Um, 
but yeah, the, uh, the 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 Harudin entry, the Vlad's brother-in-law uh, way in is is pretty fun. Stealth is also absolutely fine on this heist. I I do enjoy it. I love the the all the intrigue around Vlad being a watcher is alluded to. It keeps us sort of on track with the Kataru story in this DLC, despite the fact that this is all taking place before the White House. It's um. It adds to the narrative in, in a really positive way, I think, um, as much of the Silk Road campaign did. Um, but it did so on a really fun heist. Again, it's a holdout heist that's made it into uh, a playground style, just you against the cops experience. So I I don't love the that we have to use the beast and we have to repair it with parts. I think the beast could have just stayed as a big bank exclusive. Um, repairing the beast is Always annoying. Uh, as it's going outside on this heist because of all the sniper coverage and SWAT van turrets coverage. But um, it all plays into the experience, I think. Uh, the idea that you can hold the outside of the bank is cool if you're feeling really, uh, really on the ball on that particular day. So I'm going to drop it in. It's above all of these, I think. I think I'll just drop it behind the OG classic bank. Santa's Workshop. I, this is a reuse of assets from day two of Framing Frame. I think some people don't realize that. Kind of weird. Kind of a clever reuse because that heist so barely gets any play, right? Most of the time you snuck day one, so you just sneak right the way through day two. Um, but this is another one of those infinite loot heists if you want it to be. I think the spawns are, are pretty erratic and can make it a little more intense it's definitely not my recommendation stick to cook off if you want to earn a lot of money um and so it, it falls somewhere around cook off i think it's i think it's a little bit worse than cook off um uh, but it, it, it does the job of being a, a festive heist with a good soundtrack and more of vlad's crazy dialogue it's 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 not a heist I'm ever disappointed to play. I just don't think it brought an awful lot to the table. It did actually bring the, the flamethrower trap, which we just never saw again. But and it, that was cool, I suppose. <laughs> Scarface Mansion, um, really unique heist. Probably the Butcher's best heist. Um, I love that the outside can be completely cleanly stealth because there's no pages, which means you can be even cleverer about how you approach kills. You can not bother body bagging things because you know okay he's out of sight of him and that camera can't see that or i'm going to launch this guy into the water don't worry there's no pager to deal with i love that section of the heist then when you stealth into the building it gets a lot more claustrophobic close quarters and the heist sort of evolves in that sense and then the assassination on on soza is is good and, and well designed and the actual interior of the mansion looks brilliant in loud the objectives are just as good as well actually I, i've got a lot to praise scarface mansion for i think I, I think the greatest issue it has is at the end, it goes, okay, you, you kill Ernesto Sosa, now grab some loot. And it's like, oh, do I really now need to move bags? Like, I've just done all the fun parts of the heist, now for the tedium. And um, I know Payday is a game about stealing loot, so it's fine. These things happen. But um, I really hope Payday 3 comes across with a better idea on how we secure loot. Um, because... Moving bags one by one ain't it. I think Payday the Heist did it in a much more uh, intuitive gameplay way. Maybe it didn't make as much sense from a, from a mechanical standpoint. Or, or from a, a logical standpoint, I should say. But it was just a little bit easier to pick up piles of money and pretend we're, we're all ridiculously strong. Not that I'm endorsing carry stacker. I'm just saying. Bag moving is frustrating. Which leaves Scarface Mansion somewhere in between Firestarter and the Black Cat, I think. Shecklethorn Auction is up next. We're having to do a lot of scrolling up and down now. Um, we're, in the, we're in the home straight. My, my voice is on its way out, but uh, we'll get there. This video is a lot longer than I was expecting, but there are a lot of heists in Payday 2, and I have too much to say. Um, Shecklethorn Auction's an S-tier heist. Fight me. Um, I described the Bob Forest as atmospheric. Shacklethorn Auctions on a completely different level. This might just be because I'm a bit of a Lovecraft fan. Um, I I love how creepy and how ornate the architecture is. It, it feels like a completely different Payday 2 heist. It feels like somewhere we've never gone before. Um, in stealth, this heist is is incredibly fun. I love going for like the sub-5 auction cry achievement. Really, really fun to try and do solo. 
it, it's a lot of min-maxing, which I do enjoy in Payday 2. Um, the objectives are simplistic enough, but require you to move all around the map and, and see the entire place and sometimes even spot a Nephilim in the background. It's um, it's just so interesting. You've got that massive uh, painting on, on the top floor where you see the, the first see the Nephilim. Lindenhurst, of course, missing the heart. So many supernatural things, alien things are alluded to. Um, and... I think this heist does it better than any other, even things like the diamond who went first with it. Um, Shacklethorn is just, it's creepy. It is creepy. Um, and so so it nails it. And that's exactly what it was going for. Ben Franklin's eyes watching you, like, not watch with the, the dentist glasses is what I mean. Um, I think I'm thinking of the Mona Lisa. Uh, this heist in Loud, though, is just as like intense as it is in Stealth. For some insane reason, the cops are there at the auction within, like, 30 seconds. I suppose you could argue the dentist had prepared them. It was likely we were going to go after the obsidian plate. Um, but they are there instantly, and immediately the highest goes from 0 to 100. Like, two seconds in. Um, and I think that's so much fun. I think they did a really good job of making a, a pretty tight close quarters heist actually have some logical spawn locations for enemies, and they rush you at a rate of not that makes no sense that's like waterborne analogy but it's fine um it's, it's it's a ton of fun no matter what approach i think few heists do stealth and loud just as well as as shacklethorn auction even on death sentence one down um the loot we actually secure the obsidian plate is the keystone to the entirety of the secret so that's important as well and this heist introduces it in just such an awesome way shadow raid it's a bit of a beginner trap in some sense, as far as stealth is concerned. And I don't like it as much as I'm sure many members of the community do. I find the sheer quantity of loot moving to just be that bit more tedious than other stealth heists. Um, I'd rather be forced to wander around the map and, and interact with things as you are in something like the Golden Green Casino than Shadow Raid, which is just grab loot, find place for loot. But the clever thing about Shadow Raid, and it did this quite early on in Payday's life, is um, it gave you loads of options of where to secure that loot, which just makes it so that every Shadow Raid run is completely tailored to your own playstyle. And I know lots of people have like, this is how I do Shadow Raid. And I like that people have their own little mini metas around how to complete a heist. I think that's really cool. Um, so Shadow Raid nailed that with its pre-planning options in particular. Uh, it's also just a well-designed stealth playground. I mean, I've been mainly talking about loud playgrounds. That is a map that's well-designed just for gunfights. It's interesting. There's lots of cover um, ways to move around the map. And, and for stealth, that's exactly what Shadow Raid is. Not so much for loud, which is why Meltdown... It's not an amazing heist. But for stealth, it, it definitely, definitely is. Um, even down to the added possibility of there being more guards on the heist after five minutes, Shadow Raid explored a lot of stealth mechanics that would be reused to make some of the best stealth heists later. So, I'm putting it in just behind Big Oil. Similar sort of pioneer. Slaughterhouse is comfortably my least favourite of the classic heists. It sucks within challenge runs. It's a big bag carrying heist. Um, gold as well. And now I do like the, the way we're given platforms to help us move it. Um, I do actually like the setting being in a slaughterhouse. But when we're out the slaughterhouse in the second half of the heist, we're just basically in a, a, in a big container field. There's nothing overly special about that area. It's really limited in terms of cover. The spawns are pretty frustrating to deal with. Oftentimes, enemies will spawn behind you no matter where you hold out. And you will have to hold out for a very extended period of time. Um, it's another waiting simulator in some senses. You've got bag carrying simulators, which are egregious in one sense. And that's what we have at the start. Then it's a waiting simulator because we just have to wait for the, for the stuff to be hidden and then moved. It's just such a slow heist. Um, so I, I don't hate it in terms of its like base gameplay, in terms of the gunfights, but it's just so slow. So um, Slaughterhouse has to go into C for me. Um, it's better than the Bomb Dockyard. It's better than Aftershock as well. And probably better than these two. 
Drop it in just behind breaking feds, in my opinion. Stealing Christmas. What a what a surprise heist. Like a, another Vlad and Harudin go crazy heist that actually turned out to be really solid. Um, it's well designed in pretty much every respect. The objectives are all good, force you all over the map, and in each area there's different sorts of levels of cover, different approaches. Then you're forced onto the roof where you have a whole issue. Another issue, this is a, a good example of snipers being used well. They make it very difficult for you just to waddle over and place the C4. Instead, you have to be cautious about how you take out the snipers first. I like that. That's how snipers should be used. They're also within range of most weapons. So spot on. Well done, Stealing Christmas. You actually uh, you actually nailed it there. Um, it's got to be an A-tier heist. It joins the most uh, prolific category for me. And... Um, it's probably in the top half. I think I prefer it to the likes of Firestarter and Scarface. I think I'll pop it in just behind Black Cat. Transport Train Heist is uh, one of my least favorite stealth heists in the game. I mean, it's a loud heist as well, but I don't know why you do it loud. It's a lot faster in stealth, um, and it's pretty frustrating and loud too. Um, I don't know why I hate this heist so much. Well, it's, it's difficult, and it comes very early within the storyline, which makes my career mode runs a little bit... Harder than I'd like them to be sometimes. So that, that's probably why I personally have it out for it. But um, I don't think it's just that. It, it, it's a funny one. Like this was released within the Armored Transport package as like a secret heist. This was not meant to be accessed unless you found some secret documents within the regular Armored Transports. Um, so it kind of functions as such. And I think it would be fine as a standalone heist if... Even as a loud heist, if it was just a case of grabbing the turret parts, getting the ammunition, but there was another way to move all the ammunition at once. Instead, on harder difficulties, you have to move 20 bags of ammunition. At release, those bags even exploded just to make life worse. Um, nowadays, that's not an issue, but it's still just bag after bag after bag. And then if, if a cop spots you 15, 20 minutes into bag moving, unlucky, you go in loud or you're starting again. So... Um, it, it's that, that that makes it such a frustration. The, the fact that uh, everything could go perfectly. A bag could be spotted due to some slightly unfortunate passing. You have to start again. I don't think it's that bad of a heist, but I dislike it quite intensely. Uh, just below... I'm going to move this safe house heist. Just, just one up. Because I hate the bomb dark yard and I don't hate the safe house raid. Um, this is just me being honest and saying this is not a bad heist and this is not a bad heist. I just have personal issues with them. <laughs> the transport heists, though, are, are pretty good. They're quintessential B-tier, loud, fun houses again. Like, it's there's not much to it from an objective standpoint. It's just a case of drilling or using C4 and then the saw or lot picking your way in. So there are sort of different approaches for different builds. Um, but I think... Once again, these are these are heists. It's a little bit like four stores. These are the heists that are probably the biggest inspiration when it comes to creating multiplayer maps. They're well designed with lots of cover, um, and that's why we see them within Payday Crime War. So yeah, transport heists, well designed, kept them simple. Um, what what looks now to me like quite a simple DLC actually had quite a lot to it at release. Armored transport, not bad. Ukrainian job. I mean, it just has to sit by jewelry store, right? They're basically the same heist, except this one is a big C4 Russia. You do it on harder difficulties quite easily as, as a nice experience spike towards the start of an infamy, I suppose. Uh, the objectives are quite different. I think Ukrainian job teaches you a, a different lesson to jewelry store, and it has that little bit of additional complexity with the... Um, with things like the metal detector. So if you want to do a traditional stealth heist on Ukrainian job, it's just that bit more interesting. Oh, and there's a, there's a camera guard as well. So yeah, Ukrainian job just edges out jewelry store. Um, the Ukrainian prisoner heist, one of the more recent releases, completely slept on. Yet another of the recent DLC campaigns that make it to S tier. This heist is brilliant. I I. I can't stress enough how good this heist is. Um, in stealth, it's maybe a little too easy. There we go. I think I've got my only criticism out the way. Um, but except for that, 
outside of the fact it's a little easy in stealth, it's still loads of fun. Um, it's great to move across this absolutely massive heist map um, while you you're actually in a sense you're escorting someone but it's not so frustrating because it's not an escort like we're used to on, on things like green bridge um and every objective is is kind of fascinating there's a lo load of choice you can choose to go left or right twice which means there are sort of four different approaches um to each time you go through the heist depending on how you mix and match then there's a lot of randomization early on as well um, I, I just like the way all the objectives are set up. I like the way the heist moves and, and constantly you're dealing with new threats and you have different advantages, different areas to take cover in. Um, it's just such a dynamic heist. That's probably the best word for it, both in loud and stealth. Loud is much harder than stealth and is my preferred way of playing it. Um, it's a tough loud heist actually because it's quite open because the, the map stretches on. Um... And especially at the end, when you, you're trying to actually flee with Vlad, there is a ton of resistance, which is exactly what you'd expect, right? Here comes the choppers. Um, here come the snipers. That's where I don't mind the difficulty suddenly spiking. Then you have to be sensible, then you have to take cover, and then you have to sort of change the approach. But throughout the earlier sections, it, it's all about pacing yourself and, and staying on the move. Um, I can obviously just wax lyrical about this heist all day. I need to move on because we're like well over an hour into this but um what i will also mention is that this heist didn't seem to do a whole lot with the story but it actually took the story of the city of gold and maybe the entire sort of post-game dlc's narrative a lot further than you realize because vlad has some insanely revealing lines he talks a lot about harudin he talks about a lot a lot about the groups that might be after the payday gang and i think this is important information and i think if you don't play the Ukrainian prisoner heist and you don't listen to these things, you're missing out on some of the best story beats within Payday 2's recent releases. So please give the Ukrainian prisoner heist a go. I'm not necessarily saying you need to buy the DLC, just hop on and, and play it with a friend or, or with randoms who are hosting a lobby. Such a good heist. Undercover is another classic. It falls right up next to uh, Panic Room and Counterfeit. I think I'll put it just below Counterfeit. I find the snipers in Undercover just that little bit more irritating. But um, this is the definition of a classic heist, I would say. Everything about it feels a little bit old-fashioned and maybe a little bit janky at times. It's another example of having to escort someone, fortunately, quite briefly. But... Um, we actually interrogate them in, in a pretty violent fashion, which is kind of unique, I suppose. I'm not saying that I want more heists where I can punch random like civilians in the face, but uh, it is something worth thinking about. I find it a little bit frustrating when the power gets pulled on this ice. It's often so hard to find where the power is to defend it until it gets pulled, but that's such a minor gripe. Um, it is a little bit br bland and brown, and it's mainly indoors, a little bit like a, a No Mercy, but with snipers that shoot you through the window so it, it isn't the most pretty heist but i think from from an objective standpoint and, and predominantly from a gameplay standpoint it really holds its own and, and works well within payday 2. next up we have watchdogs i'm sorry my throat is on its way out um watchdogs is another a, a classic heist not that it actually came from payday the heist but it's a classic in that this was one of the beta heists um but it's it's not aged overly well, and I think I'm I'm too kind to them. Like th this heist is a bad moving simulator on two pretty cool um, areas, but there's just nothing. There's nothing special about Watchdogs these days. It, it's been pretty much outdone by almost every other heist. Um, so whilst you might love it for the nostalgia factor, and it's not a bad heist by any means, I'd rather play everything else that's above it. Above, above Watch Dogs, I truly believe that, which feels sad to say because, you know, Watch Dogs is so iconic and is such a classic within Payday 2. Um, I can't go too deep on it because the gameplay is so, so basic. You're just moving bags, um, <laughs> throwing bags into a boat on day two. I, I like that it's dark sometimes and sometimes it isn't. Um, what else do I like? Uh, on higher difficulties, they do make it a little harder. You, can't necessarily get inside the warehouse. Um, that's kind of cool variation changes, but 
Um, I, I don't think it's enough to push it up the tier list, sadly. Okay, let's quickly talk about the White House, because sadly, it's not the best heist ever added to Payday 2, as I think a lot of us wanted it to be. It is the culmination of all of the Payday story until we got the uh, post-game DLCs. And um, it gets a lot of it very right, I think. Of course, it is the uh, it, it contains the secret, which is the, the culmination of one of the largest ARGs within video games, one of the best ARGs, at least in my slightly biased opinion, um, within video games. The secret itself is cinematically wonderful. It's huge for the story. It gives us the, the true secret ending. It's so important for Payday 2's story. But it's not that much fun to do, unless you're the one initially solving it. If you were the one solving it, or you chose to not research it at all and successfully completed the secret, first of all, incredible work. Secondly, I imagine that was immensely satisfying and you enjoyed it. But if you did it off the back of someone else's work, you're cross-referencing constantly, it's tedious in many ways. It's just tedious. Satisfying but tedious. So that doesn't give it as many bonus points. It doesn't push it into S tier as it might have had they made a slightly more fun mini game to finish things off. Um, as a regular heist though, the White House really does its job well. Um, it's a great stealth heist. Sometimes it's very claustrophobic. Sometimes it feels like there's a lot of space um, to move around in. I like that. I think towards the end in the Peoc, it gets a little bit messy. Not a huge fan of stealthing that and of course we have to suspend our disbelief based on the fact that we're literally stealing the, the pardons from in front of these guards eyes like they don't react to the uh massive vault opening but um that isn't a, a reason to really drag it down as a loud heist it's fun hectic a little bit ridiculous obviously the white house is not designed to function as a loud heist because it's designed to look like the White House. So you can be a little short on cover and it can it can get a little bit too messy in my opinion at times. Um, but I do like the little set pieces, things like the, the, the car driving through to, to block your way and stuff. There's a degree of sort of panic and desperation bearing in mind the Payday Gang is literally heisting the White House. Um, so, and the objective of stealing the pardons, whilst ridiculous in reality, is, I think, kind of a good way to, to wrap a bow around what we thought was the ending, of course, until we found the secret ending, which is nowhere near as neat a bow, and uh, we have to suspend our disbelief even more. But um, I still love Payday 2's endings, and, and the White House delivered in, in many ways. It, it looks good as well. It really is an impressive final heist. Um, frame rate issues may drag it down in other people's tier lists. I'm fortunate enough that I may, I've been able to play it at 30, uh, at 60 FPS, sorry, not 30. Uh, I imagine 30 is what you used to play in it on. And um, when everything is working, the White House feels great. White Christmas, though, is is not great. It introduces Harudin, who's a great character. Back then, he was just known as Vlad's brother-in-law. But... Um, Similar to Santa's Workshop, I mean, I think it's it's marginally better than than those two. It's just not got a whole lot to it. I suppose it's an infinite loot heist in some sense, but I don't know many people who play it that way. There was a challenge when it came out that was like that. But it's a, it's a wide open map, but without an awful lot of variation. Um, the objectives are virtually non-existent. It's just don't die, which is fine. It's not a massive complaint, but it's not incredibly interesting either. So I think White Christmas is really a victim of its own simplicity, even though the map layout's pretty cool, and, and I like that we, we get introduced to this ridiculous drunken Harunin character, but it's just, it's just not, it doesn't nail the gameplay side of things, I don't think. The Yacht Heist, the, one of the most anticipated stealth heists, it was anticipated for years after it was found, or references to a boat heist was found in Payday the Heist game files, um, and I think it delivered, it's a pretty solid stealth heist um i like that this heist kind of requires again a pen and paper or some good memory while you work out and locate all the uh the money bundles early on and then it's simply a case of, of escaping from there i think it's it's clever once again that they prevent you from ecm rushing this or at least pretty much prevent you from ecm rushing this unless you're in a team um, I was happy to see that with more stealth heists, especially ones that are like quite conceptually simple here, but can be um, complex to play through because of how the map is laid out. 
So with that in mind, I'm going to drop it as a uh, as a good stealth heist, actually above the likes of a Lesso and Hopstrom Re Revenge. I think whilst it, it's it's easier than like the Alesso heist, it's, it's just a little bit cleaner overall. Um, the, the John Wick heists were, were, were pretty good, to be honest. Okay, let's finish this off with uh, Matt and Master. Last but not least, the most recent heist release in Payday 2, and they pretty much nailed it. I mean, the campaign closes for both the Silk Road and the City of Gold were brilliant. I think Bullets Mansion edges Mountain Master out. I just think there's something about Bullets Mansion that that blew me away. I, I think a lot of time and energy went into creating that heist, to be honest. It was teased for a long time. Whereas Mountain Master just kind of popped up in some sense, but that does not mean it's a bad heist. It's sprawling, goes across three sort of separate environments, which all have very different... Um, objectives, different uh, gameplay flows, both in stealth and in loud, um, which is good. It, it makes a single day heist, which is very sort of solid and consolidated in the way I mentioned the Alaskan deal is. It makes it feel like it could actually be a multi day heist, but it, it, it's it's a lot more experience in a shorter period of time. I think that's the beauty of these these more refined single day heists we see these days. Um, and so from top to bottom, Mountain Master is a load of fun. I think it's a little bit on the easy side, um, particularly loud. But it's also quite satisfying in that sense, because you can essentially kite all the enemies around the map because of how the uh, the actual mansion is set up. Um, and I think this was an intentional design decision, so I'm certainly not going to complain about it. Uh the assassination objective in stealth is really cool and really fun and it's a little bit different to how we normally deal with uh, boss type enemies. In loud, the boss is pretty cumbersome. It's, it's a little bit messy unless you have uh, melee skills, but I'm not going to really drag it down um, tremendously as a result of that because everything leading up to the boss fight is so fun. And um, the boss is at least a spectacle. It's just a little bit tricky and it can be the brick wall when it comes to DSOD. Um, yeah, so Mountain Master sits somewhere towards the higher end of A tier. I, I think I, I compared it before to Alaskan Deal, except it's like a, a much more, it's tight. All the mechanics work just like Alaskan Deal, but it's a much more sprawling and, and wide open um, heist. There's just a, there's a lot more to do. Wide open is wrong. Alaskan Deal is more wide open, but Mountain Master is, uh, is, is like more of a maze. There's, there's more going on there. So, yeah. Fantastic overkill have uh, there's there's a clear pattern that there's been an improvement I think over the last few months. I, I think um the Silk Road campaign had its ups and downs, amazing ups with Bullets Mansion, pretty unimpressive releases like Border Crossing. But um overall the quality has just been really very solid with Ukrainian Prisoner, with the the Dragon Heist, with Mountain Master and of course Black Cat. They're all towards the top end be at the lowest, which is super impressive. So here you can see my completed tier list. It took me a very long time to do this. I uh, I appreciate your patience, especially if you've sat around for the entire thing. Tiering heists is surprisingly difficult, and I always like to follow up with my reasoning behind things. You know, something isn't just an A tier because, oh, Nolly thinks it's fun. But there's always a greater reason behind it. And so I've tried to do that for every single heist, and that's why it's taken so long. Um, hopefully this was fun to sort of sit back and listen to whilst doing literally anything else. Um, thank you so much for watching this video, ladies and gents. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to Pass Nolly for one quick word from the sponsor. You know who it is. As you may know by now, I have a continued partnership with Apex Gaming PCs. And within that partnership, I have my own line of gaming PCs designed specifically with Payday 2 in mind. Payday, of course, is a game that drops a fair few more frames than it probably should, considering its age. This is also a decent purchase if you're considering future-proofing yourself with Payday 3 coming out in 2023. So check them out from the link in the description. Thanks once again. I'll see you all very soon.